And we are live on this cold January day. Ice everywhere and people at that store talking about frozen pipes and all those things. So I told Bill Morris yesterday, I said, Bill, this is kind of year for plumbers, isn't it? He just kind of shuddered and laughed a little bit. Anyway, thank you for being where it's nice and warm. And today we finish up the last of our lessons in Revelation on the seven churches. And we're really a spillover that goes into chapter 4 where our uh, scripture lesson comes from chapter 4, 1 through 11 as we talk about a look into heaven. Anybody who wants to know what's going on in heaven, well, John showed us a little bit about what was going on. So we'll read that and go into that as we after we say a prayer. Father, we once again, we thank you for the opportunity to be in your house and thank you for a nice warm place to be that we can come out of the cold and just sit on nice seats and hear the word. We thank you that you give us this opportunity and I pray personally that you th and thank you for the opportunity to hear and ask that everything I'd say and do would glorify you today this morning and that everything we do today in Sunday service would bring glory to you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. He said John got this vision on the island of Patmos after he was being uh, punished per se, I guess is the way to describe it, for being one of the disciples. The only one of the disciples, or as we've learned on Thursday night, apostles, sent ones, uh, who hadn't been martyred. And he's about 90 something years old uh, and he got this vision of the risen Christ. Um, in chapter 1 he saw him in all his glory for the eyes of fire, the white hair, the dress, the Rode down to the floor, the feet of bronze, and Jesus had told him to write down everything he'd seen. And then we had read, then he goes into chapters two and three where we had to get a vision of seven letters written to seven churches. And by the way, our uh, diggers here who find things have found a picture of Holman Hunt's uh, vision of Jesus knocking on the door. The old bloodhounds went and found it yesterday, so. I might have to get the camera pan down and get a picture of it later on. But anyway, uh, the picture of Holman Hunt last week, Light of the World, Jesus Knocking on the Door, is to my right or to your left if you're looking at me on the video. But anyway, back to the day. Uh, let me read chapter 4. And uh, this is a vision of heaven. And after this, I looked, John, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here. And I will show you what must take place after this. And at once I was in the spirit. And behold, a throne stood in heaven with one seated on the throne. And he who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Carnelian. And around, and around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. Around the throne were 24 thrones. And seated on the thrones were 24 elders, clothed in white garments with golden crowns on their heads. And from the thr throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings of Heels of thunder, and before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was, as it were, a sea of glass like crystal. And around the throne, on each side of the throne, were four living creatures, full of eyes in front and back. And the first living creature like a lion, the second living creature like an ox, the third creature with the face of a man, and the fourth living creature stuck it, like an eagle in flight. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within, and day and night they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And whom, whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the twenty-four elders <clears throat> fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him, who lives forever and ever. And they cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. And that's the word of God for the people of God. <clears throat> Certainly, may God bless the reading of the word. As we mentioned in the previous lesson, the church is seen only in the first three chapters of Revelation. Uh, we've certainly completed our review of the historic and prophetic significance of those seven churches as we went through each one of those churches in how they represented individual Christians and churches in the church age. Now it's time to look uh, at the church's relationship to heaven. Specifically, the church that's going to be on the earth at the end of this present age, just prior to the tribulation period that the rest of the book of Revelation talks about. Uh, 
We know if you are what we call pre-tribulation, and most evangelical teachers that I've ever been associated with read are pre-tribulation, which means the church will not go through the tribulation. There are some who believe it will go. The church will be here halfway through it. Some will say they'll go through it. And as Charles Stanley said, we will not not break bread with you about disagreement, but we'll tell you we're right on the way up. But anyway, uh, I think Scripture, if you stay consistent with it, says that the church will be removed from the earth and be kept from the trials of the tribulation period, only to return when the Lord comes back in Revelation 19 at the second coming. But anyway, the rapture of the church is not mentioned specifically in Revelation, but it's alluded to, I think, kind of obviously in how people overlook it. Like I said, there's people of smarter minds than me who spent time in divinity school that probably can argue differently, but if you read it to its T here, I think you just kind of read to it. We know the church is on the earth at the end of Revelation 3 because everything that we begin saying is let the ear, him who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And at the re- and the church is no longer mentioned after Revelation 4, but one time, and that's at the very end of chapter 22. So certainly, if the church was going through everything that we'd see, won't you think the Lord would have given some words of advice and counsel to a church of people of his own who are going through the midst of everything that's going on? But we'll get the argument in a few minutes or later on. Well, anyway, the sequence of events in the book of Revelation gives us an idea that the church is no longer around. In Revelation 1, 19, it's a key verse for understanding the entire book of Revelation. It's like a uh, table of contents. John is told to write the things which you've seen and the things which are and the things which will take place after this. So John is told to write the book of Revelation in three parts. The first section was John's vision of Jesus as he stood there and he saw the Lord speaking to him and giving him all that, which, saw, which encompasses almost all of chapter 1. The second section is what we spent the last two or three months doing is the letter to the seven churches. Well, the third section of Revelation takes over the entire rest of the book, begins in Revelation 4 and goes all the way to the end is the things which must take place after this. Well, after this refers to the church's translation from earth to heaven because we know that there's a couple ways to get to heaven. Either the Lord died, the body goes into the grave, the spirit goes to heaven, and then you read the body is resurrected and when the Lord returns, or if we're still alive, we're raptured into heaven. But this translation from the earth, John is talking about here. So John is recording after this from verse 4, chapter 4, verse 1, all the things that happen on earth after the church has been resurrected. So, well, One of the other things that I think tells us a little bit that something has to happen is I said the word church appears 19 times in Revelation 1 through 3, but not one single time throughout the rest of the book of Revelation. Quote, it does occur one in chapter 22, verse 16, which says that the vision of this entire vision was given to the church. So that's kind of an editorial reference. So hey, there is no reference from this point on about the church. As we said also, also, Jesus has been saying, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches throughout the first three chapters. The next time something similar to that is mentioned is over in Revelation 13, and here's what it says. If anyone has a hear, let him hear. Not what it says to the churches, but to the individuals. So certainly, there's no mention of church anymore in the book of Revelation. Well, one of the other things I think that shows us that the church is no longer on earth is in Revelation 2 and 3, who is in the midst of the churches? The Holy Spirit. In Revelation 4 and 5, we find the Spirit is where in front of the throne in heaven. So that we know that the Holy Spirit dwells in the church today and it dwells in the church within the individuals. When the church is in, when the Spirit goes through the book of Revelation, it's no longer in this individuals. He's coming upon people the way he did in the Old Testament. Best example was Samson. Remember Samson was tied up. The Spirit had come upon him and he snatched the walls down. All those different things. So the Spirit is in heaven no longer on earth. Why? All true believers have been resurrected and are in heaven. And then, of course, 2 Thessalonians adds a little bit of insight to this. 2 Thessalonians 2, 7 and 8 is a very important key because it describes that the mystery of lawlessness uh, only occurs after the rapture and the spirit, the lawless one, is revealed. And who restrains evil in the world today? The Holy Spirit. 
And he is no longer here. And when the restrainer is away, literally all hell breaks loose on the earth, which is why it's so bad during this tribulation period. I'm just giving you these arguments that I think are from scripturally based that says, hey, we ain't going through all, all that mess that people... And I think that's why so many people are afraid to read Revelation. Oh, it's scary. I don't want to go through it. But if you know the truth, you ain't going to be here. One last thing that I think is important here is there's some similarities between Revelation 4, 1 and 2 that I just read. 1 Corinthians 15 and 1 Thessalonians 4. They are New Testament references that gives us an idea of the rapture. Because the rapture word is never explicitly said. And if you lay them all three together, there are some similarities about the church being taken away. In Revelation 4, 1, John says, I heard a voice beckoning me to heaven, which is very parallelous to 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, which says the in the last, it, when the rapture heard, there'll be a voice of the archangel calling the church. There's a voice, a trumpet, and all those dead in Christ are risen. And then, of course, John says he hears a voice like a trumpet, and certainly that's the same thing heard over in uh, Thessalonians. And then, uh, one last thing, <clears throat> there's a change. John says, I was immediately in the Spirit. And then when we slip over to 1 Corinthians, when Paul's talking about being resurrected, he says the incorruptible, put, excuse me, the corruptible putting on incorruption. In the mortal, that mortal put on mentality. So the voice, the trumpet, and the change certainly describe all, indicate there's a significant shift in orientation from being on the earth to being physically in the heaven, in the spirit, where all the things that we're getting ready to talk about are. And then those who want to keep further can read further into 5, 6, 7, 8 in the Revelation and find out. Well, now that I've beaten it to pieces that I think we're all pre tribulationists here, let's talk about what John sees when the church is in heaven. John says he sees a door standing open in heaven that allows him to have access. He says, behold, you know, if we were going on Thursday night, we have plenty of time to go slower through this, like people tell me to do. We would talk about behold to the door and that word behold means something. But anyway, John sees a door that allows him to have access that he's taken into heaven. Now, the next time we see a door, is in Revelation 19 when that door is opened up. Do you want know what that allows to happen? Doors open so that Jesus on the white horse and the churches and the saints can come back at the second coming. So there's a takes us in and takes us out. And that's a lesson for another day. Now the key in Revelation 4 is the throne. <clears throat> it occurs a dozen times in the, in the book of Revelation. The throne we know is a symbol of sovereignty and authority. Of course, in God's case. And the God being in the authority over the earth is the great theme of Revelation. Remember, the book is the apocalypse, the awakening or the revealing of Jesus in all his vision. So when John is taken into heaven, the first thing he sees is this vision of the throne. It is the center point of what he sees. And I wish I had that picture of that slide that uh, Rusty had did when he did through Revelation because it gives us a picture of but the picture is worth a thousand words of what John sees here. So regardless of how chaotic things are going on, on the earth, everything is under God's control in heaven as he's ruling us. Now, it is this very throne that we're going to talk about that is full of thunderings and lightnings and wrath that we have the blessing to come unto today when we need. Hebrews tells us we can find grace and come before the throne of grace any time that we want because we have been born into the family. But you have to realize that in Revelation 4, the time of grace is over. The grace age is in and it's a time of wrath being poured out onto the earth. And now the throne in heaven is a throne of judgment and wrath that is getting ready to be poured out on the book of Reve in the rest of Revelation, which began really in chapter 6 when the seals are broken and all those naughty, nasty things that we see come through. But what does John see? He sees this throne and seated upon the throne, he says was... Something that looked like Jasper is none other than the Father. Uh, he says it looked like Jasper and Sardius stone in appearance. Now, one of the things that we read this, John did he said, John didn't do a very good job describing it, but you know, how do you describe things that are in heaven? I mean, in our my finite brain, in our mouth, and the things we see, we you know, we come back, we've been to Hawaii or uh a roof or somewhere, and we just try to describe what the water looks like. You can show somebody a picture and they say, well, that's beautiful. But if you try to describe it, you're like, yeah. It's kind of like the story about the little girl who was born blind. And she had this surgery, and all of a sudden she could see. 
And she went to the window and she says, Mama, why didn't you tell me how beautiful it was? She said, I tried to. In the only way I could. So John is trying to describe what it looks like of the Father sitting on the throne. He said, This looks like Jasper, almost like a clear through diamond that you just light this reflects through. Now, Jasper and Sardis aren't mentioned anywhere else in Scripture but here, but certainly we know they were precious stones that were during that age that people have them today. You know, ladies love to have their rings with all the different stones and onyx and sapphires and all that. And, What's the green one called? Uh, Emerald. Emerald. You know, you got to love those things. All of those things are described here. Uh, so the mention is is just radiance and power and glory of this one who is sitting on the throne. And John 4.24 tells us that to the best of it, and Granny said a long time ago, and I did, it went through my mind, but it was very, she said, I don't know if we'll ever be able to see what the Father looks like. Because John tells us God has no physical appearance, the Father. So she said that, and you know, I kind of let it go, and I said, yeah, yeah, whatever. But now, beginning to think, you know, we don't really ever see a vision of what the Father, this is as close. Remember, uh, Moses had a chance in the Old Testament, but he had to stand back too, and he held his hand over him, and he could have walked by and see it. But there's this vision, he says, I just saw like someone sitting on the throne, and he looked like this. That's the only the visual radiance that we can see. Don't know. We, hey, we want to have new eyes when we get to heaven, so maybe we'll be able to do it. We know today, if we want to see God, who do we look at? Jesus. He is the vision of God, and that's a lesson in Colossians. That would be a good series to do sometime. So John walks in, and he opens up, well, opens up the heaven, and he goes into the throne room, and on the throne is the Father. Now, surrounding the throne is a rainbow. Now, when we think of rainbows, it's what? Red and green. What colors are they? Orange and red. Huh? Yeah. More uh, red, orange, yellow, yep. green. All those colors of the, of the spectrum, as we would say. All those different things. But this one is like an emerald, so it's green. So we get this green emerald. Now we know the uh, rainbow's reminder of God's, back in Genesis, is faith that He would never destroy the world again by, by a flood. And so the rainbow here is a symbol of the mighty one sitting on the throne with this rainbow around it as a vision of God as a covenant keeping God. He protects his own. And hey, the church is there and those there have been protected. Well, John starts to pan around a little bit and he sees some other people around the throne in verse 4. He says, I saw 24 thrones and 24 elders sitting on those. And the elders were clothed in white robes and had crowns of gold on their heads. Does anybody know who these elders represent? Who we say is no longer on the earth? The church. So this is a symbolic of the church who had followed Christ and died, had given their lives for the Lord who are now symbolically sitting around the throne. How do we know they are representatives of the church? And when I say church, those are believers who put their faith in Christ uh, as a result of his death at Calvary and the very first one who came to salvation through when he saved him. This is the representation of the church. is by what they say. To understand what they truly say, I'm not going to have them read it, but you slip over to chapter 5 in verses 8 and 10, we hear what they are saying, and here's what they sing and say. For you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. So who are the people who are redeemed? All of us, all those who ever sat in here, all who ever will sit here, and those who all the other, those people who believed on the cross, he saved them by the blood, are represented by these 24 elders around this throne because they said they were redeemed. Now they say a little more than that, but that's the key words I want to say. Hey, this is the church, those believers who have said, hey, yeah, I've repented and accepted the Lord into my life. They are the church. The elders are declaring that they shall reign on the earth, and we know that shortly when the earth, Jesus comes back, they will reign on the throne with the Lord for the thousand year reign in, in, in Revelation 24. So Jesus, the throne is there by, we know it's the church by the words on their lips, but also by what they're wearing. They're clothed in white robes. The saints that are returning from with Jesus at the second coming who come back with him on the white horse, they are too dressed in fine linen and white clothes. And that we are told that those bright linen clothes are the righteous acts of the saints. We also know that they are also considered the bride of Christ. 
19, Revelation 19, 7 tells us that they are the bride of Christ and she has adorned herself in the white raiments. So we know that the elders and the saints and the believers of the church age are those who are dressed in white, they're claiming redemption through the words, and one thing they have on their head that nobody else has, they have crowns. They were wearing crowns of gold in their head. Now the word translated in the Greek for the crown is not the word for diadem, which, you know, like Queen Elizabeth would wear on her head. These are the crowns worn by the victors, like you would wear if you won a race or won the, you know, whatever you were involved, the champions of the day. So the elders aren't rulers, they are victors. They're wearing the victor crowns, really to translate the Stephanus. Only the church has been judged and re received the reward. Because Paul tells us that one day in heaven, all of us will stand before the Lord uh, to receive what we've done. So every time we got up and we vacuumed the floor, we gave clean the park, helped to clean the church, everything we ever did for the Lord, we receive a reward for. And these are the rewards that these guys have. They are the crown elder, none of the church, all those who believed in Christ and received the rewards at the judgment seat for everything that we've ever done for the Lord. And we do it. So these are the church there. <clears throat> now John is looking and he sees these guys and he says, I also heard something. He says there was this sounding forth from the throne of lightnings and thundering and voices. Certainly reminiscent of, anybody remember? All the way back to the Old Testament. Good old Moses, where was he at? Mount Sinai when he received the Ten Commandments. Thunder and lightnings and all that were doing it. It's certainly a display of the power of the Lord given the law in the judgment of that day. And certainly representative of this throne, as I said now, is a representative of the thundering and things that are getting ready to happen into chapter 6. All those cataclysmic events are getting ready to come and it's all coming from this throne. And the, we see the picture around it is none other than these elders and uh, the fathers there and all that's there. Now John also goes on to detail we have more time, we can just go into deep detail about different things and how it translates, but I've got to get it in before the preacher gets here. Over in verse 6, John says, I see something that was spread out in front of the throne. So, I don't know if we had a, up here where the cross is at, maybe that's the throne in between me and that. He sees something. He says, it looked like a sea of glass, like a crystal. Now, we don't certainly know exactly what that means, but it's very similar again to something that Moses saw in the Old Testament. Good old Moses and Aaron and the 70 elders of Israel as they approached God in Exodus 24. Here's what it says. And there was under his feet as it were a paved work of sapphire stone and it was like the very heavens in its clarity. I didn't realize that was in the Exodus. Exodus 24.10. So we get a picture of the throne room and our eyes are starting to expand and get a little more. Well, you know when you go into first... If you go into a building or someplace and you see something, and then you begin to see, and you begin to, and you get to see more and more things. So John is opening the picture for us. The throne, the rainbow around the throne, thunderings and lightnings coming from, 24 elders around the throne, and before it, this sea of glass. Now it's also possible that what he sees here is the same material and appearance as mentioned over in Revelation 21, verse 21. So you ain't got to turn to it. Hey, the commentary is giving it to me. He says in verse 21, I saw the street of the New Jerusalem was pure gold like transparent glass. Now the gold in heaven is not like the gold that we have today. You know, we put on our rings and we get a bar of gold. You can't see through it because it's got impurities in it. And the, you know, the better the gold, the more you pay for it. You know, I spent, oh, he spent 10000 on my diamond ring. You know. you know, the more we spend on it, the higher quality is in heaven, it's transparent gold. So transparent you can see through it because John says when you're walking those streets of gold that we say our loved ones go see, you can see right through it. It's gold, but it's transparent gold. Maybe this is something, certainly this, whatever this is before the throne, John is just trying to describe it in the only words he see. It looked like crystal glass. And all I can think of is that day that we all went down for our baptism. It was... Me and you and who else went with us that day? Alex and Doug. Remember, Doug got his foot stuck in the mud out there that day. But the water was almost like crystal. It was just a little ripple on it. The sun was at an angle, and it was all you could think is it's like the crystal sea. That's just maybe a vision of what you know 
I don't know why it's burning my brain from that day, but certainly it was just a beautiful thing to look at. And whatever it is, John said, hey, hey, this is what it looked like. It looked like a sea of crystal glass. And he's just really describing everything to what he sees. Later on, he's going to describe what those gates look like. He said, what did it look like? One big pearl. The pearly gates that we talk about. So John is just seeing things that he's never seen before in white. Well, situated in the midst of the throne, um, he sees something else. He says, I saw four living creatures. Now, it get, this image is getting even more complex as he describes, he, he says, these four living creatures full of eyes in front and back. Now, we love to talk about angels, and we see angels, oh, this looks like Jordan over there. She's so pretty and having wings on it. Or little baby fat cherubs. But this is what John describes these look like. They had eyes in front and on the back. Now, this is very similar if you know your Old Testament. That somebody else got a vision like this. Does anybody know who in the Old Testament had a vision of these four living creatures? Isaac. Well, Isaiah did one. But even one that's even more descriptive than that. It starts with the E. Ezekiel. Ezekiel. He saw these same kind of creatures um, that, they, that look almost identical to this. Some of them are different. It comes from Ezekiel 10, 14, and 15. One of these, he said, had the appearance of a cherub, one of it like a man, one like a lion, and one like an eagle. And I, you know what Ezekiel called them? Cherub. So they are a special group of angels. We know there are the guardian angels, I mean the guardian angels, the archangels, which are Gabriel and Michael, and Lucifer used to be one. And then there are the cherubs, then there's also seraphim that Isaiah saw. And then, of course, you got you know different types of angels, but these are the kind of angels that are flying around. And it seems they're very similar, so these are probably cherubs. We also saw a cherub who was stationed outside of the Garden of Eden, remember? They had a flame that kept turning that said, you ain't coming back, you messed up, get out. It's a little Rodney Island there, but anyway. But anyway, he sees these four creatures, and they are getting ready to do some things. They are the ones who want to hold back the wind, if you remember from a revelation study, and they're getting ready to go release the judgments on the earth that start in chapter 6. But they are standing there waiting for their assignments to take the, uh, first of all, to release the four horses of the apocalypse that will be released that we know are the white, the red, the black, and the pale horses that are getting ready to be released in chapter 6. But in addition to that, these four living creatures are just flying around and they are leading the congregation per se in worship. And their worship is glory and honor and thanks and power and glory, all these powerful words to the Lord that we sing about. And every time they start singing this, those 24 elders lay down before him on the throne and worship the Lord and cast their crowns at his feet. And then they say, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they exist and were created. So this is what's going on in heaven even today, if we get a picture up there, these things are just flying around. They got six wings on their back, and they got these different faces, and they are and the eyes on the front of them, and they're just flying around and praising the Lord, saying, "You're worthy to receive glory and power." And then the elders fall down and worship, and it's just a worship service, uh, like you would see if you went to the cathedrals or whatever you may be. That everybody gets excited. So this is a heavenly choir that John sees through the doors that's been opened to him. Shortly after Revelation 5, the judgments are getting ready to pour, but before doing so, the Lord is just being praised for who He is in the glory of everything that's going on there. Also around the throne, John sees these seven, um, find it again, these seven things that are, which are symbolic of the Holy Spirit. He's in heaven in front of the throne. Uh, seven fires, let me find it here, from the throne. Seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. So we know the Father is sitting on the throne. The Holy Spirit is in the midst of this. He's, the church members are singing and praising the Lord. The angels are praising the Lord. We're not going to get to it today, but if you read ahead in chapter 5, we know that one person is missing, none other than the Lamb. He's going to come upon the scene in chapter 5, holding a, uh, going to get the, what's in the Father's hand, but that's next week's. Well, not next week's lesson. It was if we were studying Revelation. But Jesus is there. We also, the whole Trinity is in heaven. But in conclusion, in the midst of all this lightning and thunders coming from the throne, uh, this praise is going on. And we can just only imagine 
<laughs> what this scene looked like to John. Remember, he's a human being just like we are. And he's seeing the elders there. He's seeing them take the crowns and lay them at the feet. And it's just a, just something that's going, it's something to be at the whole. You just couldn't imagine it. You know, the, you, some of the crowd used to have that license plate, heaven, just imagine, you know, on the plate. But it's just all that is going there. And Dr. Jeremiah says, you know, two things to conclude. We don't like to talk about rewards because we say we shouldn't do stuff to, to receive a reward. But I love what he says. When I stand before the throne, I don't want to be empty handed. There's something I want to, I want to be able to give the Lord something for what he did for me. And that's what those crowns are to do is that every time that these angels would be singing this, they lay something at the foot of the throne. It's the crowns they received for the things they did for the Lord in this life. So anytime, remember, anytime the Lord asks us to do something, remember the open door that the church in Philadelphia has? We walk through it, we receive a reward, and one day we be able to give those <clears throat> to, the th to the Lord for what he did for us. One last thing that I thought is amazing here. There's a difference in the way these people praise the Lord. The elders praise God one way, and the living creatures do it another. Look at, let me turn back to verse 8 and see how the, how the angels praise the Lord. They say, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Whereas the elders say, worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. The elders praise the Lord directly to him. As opposed to the living creatures who praise about him. Why? Because those elders have been redeemed. They have physically gone from being estranged from the Lord to being redeemed through that. And they can actually speak to Him because they have that one-on-one -on -one relationship. He's redeemed them and so they can speak directly to Him. Whereas angels have never don't need to be redeemed and they are speaking about Him. There's a difference. And I speak about somebody and I speak to them. They have personal experience. The elders do and they speak directly to Him. And the they have, I love the commentaries. The living creatures have never been saved by the blood of the Lamb. And th but those who have been saved from sin don't sing praises about God. We sing them to God. So we sing, we sing to the Father. We don't just come in and say, well, I'm just singing. No, we're actually, when we praise and sing our worship songs to the Lord, we should be singing directly to Him and not worrying about Nancy. Says, oh, Rodney can't sing a lick. I wish he'd hush. <laughs> we're going to make a joyful noise and say hey I, I don't care what Nancy thinks how I sound I'm singing to the Lord and he thinks it's beautiful so I thought that was amazing that you if you read through it you don't pick it up but if you go back and look at it this is only expositional teaching teaches you this they are singing to him and the angels are singing about him because they've never been redeemed hey of course we always say hopefully everybody can say the same thing that uh, we can sing to him because we've been redeemed from our sin and have one day we'll be able to sing around the throne in heaven when we get to heaven. And that concludes this study in that. Maybe sometime in the future we'll pick up with chapter 5 and move on into it. But next week we will return to our Old Testament and visit somebody who is, I think you will fall in love with and especially we find out all about her story none other than Esther. We will spend a couple of weeks, or a couple of months, I should say, going back to the Old Testament and seeing good old Esther and everything that she stood for and what the Lord used her to do. And as a result of what she did, there is still a feast today that if you're Orthodox Jew, that you still study and celebrate every year the Feast of Purim. So that's a tease for next week. Let's pray. Father, thank you for giving us a the opportunity to study your word, to see what future events happen, and certainly to get a vision of what it's like to be around your throne in heaven. That one day, Lord, that because what you did for us, we can stand there one day and cast our crown before your feet and say thank you and worthy and power and glory are yours forever and ever. Amen. And we ask your blessings upon us. We ask your blessings upon the service that follows. Those who couldn't be here, for whatever reason, we ask that you be with them, heal their bodies. Lord, answer our unspoken request in our heart. And we ask all these things in your name, knowing that you gave us this vision because you loved us. You always have and you always will. Amen. Amen.